This is the Thoughts from a Page podcast, which is now a member of the Evergreen Podcasts Network. My name is Cindy Burnett, and each episode I interview authors about their latest works. For more book recommendations, check out my earlier episodes and my website, thoughtsfromapage.com, and follow me on Facebook and Instagram at Thoughts from a Page. I want to say a special thanks to several people who shared my podcast recently on social media. Thanks to Bookstagrammers, Ames the Reader, NY Judester, Becky on Books, and Sweet Honey and Brie. Word of mouth is really helping me grow the show. I also want to ask for a big favor from all of you. Another great way to reach new people is to win an award. The Quill Podcast Awards were just recently launched and they are listener-nominated awards. The link is in my bio, and I would be so appreciative if you took three minutes and nominated this podcast in the Society and Culture category. There are a variety of entry categories, but you do not have to complete any of them that you don't want to. Thanks so much in advance. Today, I am interviewing Catherine St. John about The Siren. Catherine is a native of Mississippi and a graduate of the University of Southern California, who spent over a decade in the film industry as an actress, a screenwriter, and a director before turning to penning novels. When she's not writing, she can be found hiking or on the beach with a good book. Catherine currently lives in Los Angeles with her husband and her two daughters. I loved The Siren, and I have selected it for my June Buzz Reads picks. It's such a fun read. I hope you enjoy our conversation. And now for a quick break. For the last year, I have been focusing more on my health and eating habits. In connection with that, I have started drinking AG1 in the morning. When I started drinking AG1 daily, I could feel a real difference in my health and energy levels. That is because AG1 is a foundational nutrition supplement that supports your body's universal needs like gut optimization, stress management, and immune support. Since 2010, AG1 has led the future of foundational nutrition, continuously refining their formula to create a smarter, better way to elevate your baseline health. I recommend AG1 to all of my family and friends because the company has a team of doctors and scientists, it is tested for 950 contaminants, and is NSF certified for sport, it is formulated based on the latest science, and it maintains high-quality standards. Thanks, AG1, for sponsoring my show. AG1 is a supplement I trust to provide the support my body needs daily. If you want to take ownership of your health, it starts with AG1. Try AG1 and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D3K2 and five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase. Go to drinkag1.com slash thoughts from a page. That's drinkag, the number one, dot com slash thoughts from a page. Check it out. And now back to my show. Welcome, Catherine. How are you today? I'm great. How are you? I'm doing very well also, and I'm looking forward to talking about The Siren. I am too. Well, what I usually do is start out with the author talking a little bit about the book so that if people haven't read it yet, gives them a basic idea of what the book's about. Absolutely. So The Siren is what I like to call escapist fiction. There's a little bit of thriller, there's a little bit of romance, and then there's deeper themes about fame and its effect on people. The Siren is set on a beautiful Caribbean island where a film is being shot. And it's told from three different points of view, three very different women. Uh, You have Stella, who is the star of the film, who is struggling to regain her career in the wake of multiple very public breakdowns that happened over a decade ago. So she's really trying for a comeback. She also struggles with substance abuse. You have her mysterious assistant, Felicity who has designs of her own that become clear over the course of the novel. And then you have Taylor, who is the producer of the film, who is also um, trying to get her career back on track after her last job ended in scandal. So you have these three very different women with very different backgrounds, all working together in close proximity on this very small, beautiful island. Uh, And the guy producing the film is a famous movie star, Cole Power, who used to be married to Stella, the actress. They've been divorced for over a decade and they don't really get along. So, you know, why he cast her in this film is one of the central mysteries to the book. And uh, his son, Jackson Power, is directing the film and they also don't really get along. So uh, why that's happening is another mystery to the book. You know, there's a lot of different layers in the book that I feel like get peeled back over the course of it. And, you know, my last book I told from one point of view, and I thought it would be interesting with this one to tell it from a couple of different points of view, 
because I find it so interesting how we all see the world through our own eyes. We judge other people and we can't understand the way that they're seeing the world. So when you have these different multiple points of view, you are able to see how one character sees another character. And then from that other character's point of view, how, how she sees the first character and you see how the mismatch there and, and seeing that get worked out and seeing people come to understand one another over the course of the book was something that really interested me. So that's why I decided to do it from three points of view this time instead of one. When you have multiple points of view, I think you're able to release information to the reader at a different pace because when you only have one person telling the story, you're only learning what they're learning. But when you have the three different women, different little tidbits are coming out at different times from their perspectives, which I loved. Right. And you you see that one character knows something that another character doesn't know and that hid, that hidden you know secret between them you can be reading it from the point of view of the character who doesn't know this thing the other character knows and you're thinking oh my god but she doesn't know this you know <laughs> exactly i wish she did and how is she going to find it out and one of the other questions i had for you was about the format because in addition to multiple points of view you throw in Madison, the social influencers, posts occasionally, and Stella's diary, and newspaper articles and blog posts. I loved that. How did you decide to write in that format? Well, one of the big things in this book is the press. The press is a constant influence uh, in the book. And so I wanted the reader to really feel that. The press has been a constant influence in Stella's life. And in the lives of celebrities, it's always, you know, background noise. If it's not front and center, there's always paparazzi around. There's always blogs or articles or Instagrams or whatever being posted that may or may not have any shred of truth to them. And that's something that is very present for Stella. And so I wanted to make it very present for the reader and and allow it to shape the reader's experience in the same way that it has basically shaped Stella's life. I like that. Well, I thought it worked very effectively. And I actually was totally cracking up at Madison. It's always amazing to me that there are people like that and that that is their entire job. And so I just thought you portrayed her so well, and she was hilariously entertaining. Absolutely. There are lots of people like that. We see them all the time, don't we? (laughs) I have three teenagers. So when they first started telling me about some of these people, because I I don't follow any of that, you know, and they were like, they do what? And so then they'd show me and I was like, that's their whole job. And so it's just sort of funny because obviously it's become a much even bigger thing than it was when they first started telling me about it. But I just love that you included that because it's part of our modern world. And it's just so bizarre. Well, and it's also a generational thing, I think, you know, yes. Stella in the book is 40. So she's like kind of on the line. She's like a, at the top of being a millennial, the bottom of being Gen X, an, an exennial as uh, as they're <laughs> called. And so it's not, and she's hidden from the press her whole life. So it's not natural to her to want to self-promote, to want to be taking selfies and all that kind of stuff. Whereas Madison is Gen Z and she's grown up, you know, in front of the camera. She's grown up with social media her whole life. And so she embraces it. And that's really, it's just, it's very different the way that people of different ages perceive technology and use it. That's exactly right. And so I could completely relate to Stella when she's like, why is she taking these photos all the time and, you know, setting it all up? And like the one where she's in the, I don't know, by the palm trees and she's got something set up in the trees and she's taking all these photos. And Stella's like, what is happening? Why are people doing that? <laughs> but you're right. It is definitely a generational thing. And it's also the need to, uh, for Stella, she always wants to be seen in the best light. She's always thinking about like, well, how do I look? And how is you know, uh, you know, how's my makeup and how's my hair? And she, she feels the pressure to present this totally formed image all the time. Whereas Madison is, yes, she's doing all the posing and all that kind of stuff, but she also very much invites, you know, her audience into her life, which is also a more um, Gen Z type of thing, allowing people behind the curtain, or at least to feel like they're coming behind the curtain instead of presenting a finished image, which is what Stella has done her whole life. And that's actually, it's interesting. That's one of Stella's biggest stumbling blocks. And there's a part of the book that is a twist. So I I don't want to mention it and give anything away, but uh, Stella has, there are parts of herself that she has felt that she had to hide her entire public life. 
to present this image, you know, and I think that, you know, over the course of the book, she finds that she's finally able to drop this wall and just be who she is rather than who she thinks that the public wants her to be. And and that's really what, what has stood in between her and, you know, being able to be herself is this perception that the public wants me to be this person and I have to be this person. I can't just be myself. So in that way, you know, Madison, as as hilarious and terrible as she is, her her point of view is is more freeing as a person to be able to just she's not worried about, you know, the public perception. She's just being herself. She thinks she's so great that they're just going to love her. Whereas Stella comes from this generation where it's, you know, there was a lot more pressure put on women to be perfect. So that's something that she is overcoming over the course of the book. I agree. And so Stella's sort of having to pull herself into the modern era and social media and and the difference in the way that people are treated and perceived and what kind of information is disseminated. Right, right. Because while I do think you're right that Madison is inviting people in, it's still a very cultivated look in what's happening and it's still very posed, but she provides a lot more information about herself than Stella ever would have wanted to. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. And she has, shall we say, a healthy <laughs> ego, a healthy um, self-perception. What's the word I'm looking for here? No, I mean, I think that's right. I mean, she's very, she's in love with herself. Absolutely. Yeah, she is. I guess the only thing I'm thinking about with that is, and I have to tell my kids this regularly, is there's still a lot going on behind the scenes that you're not seeing and you know, makeup put on when maybe you're not noticing it or filters or just different things like that. Absolutely. And, you know, her life is edited. It's not like the camera's on all the time. And she's showing people uh, certain things that aren't necessarily true. Like the pictures that she posts of Stella are, you know, are meant to make Stella not look great. You know, like she's thinking about what she's doing. She's not stupid. Right. And so I guess it's just kind of a, a reminder for all of us, I think, sometimes that even though you see one image and one perception of a person and their character on social media, that's most likely not what's really happening. It, yeah, it's very seldom what's really happening because behind all of it, we're all pretty messy, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> For sure. Which is what makes it fun, right? And you can't write a book about people that aren't messy because who wants to read that? Felicity uh, is a really good example of that because she's a character that over the course of the novel, what she wants really shifts. And we're there with her for that. She starts off wanting one thing. And over the course of the novel, that changes and she changes. And I I think that, you know, a lot of times you feel as a writer, there's this need to want to make characters arcs very coherent and very uh, not as messy as, as humans really are. You know, there's a need, you know, to create this character that wants something and achieves it. But sometimes the lesson learned along the way to trying to achieve this goal is what ends up actually shaping that character's arc. And that's what happens with Felicity. And it's a little bit messy because she starts off wanting one thing and then she discovers, actually, I don't want this thing. I want something else, you know? And and I think that that's something that we do all the time as human beings. I mean, I know that in my life, over the course of my life, the things that I have wanted have changed and that's okay. And that's part of what it means to be human. And that's the messiness is what I enjoy writing about more than anything else. And that's what the reader enjoys reading about more than anything else. Absolutely. I also feel like over time in my life, like there are things that I have really wanted and I haven't gotten them and it's gone a different direction. And later I look back and think, thank goodness it went the way that it did because I would have been so unhappy if I'd gotten that. And now I'm down a new path that I would have never even considered. And that's worked out so well. So I think that there's a little bit of that for Felicity too. Oh, 100%. I mean, the reason that I was able to write this book set in the film industry is that I spent a decade in the film industry as an actress. And I, you know, very much wanted to have a successful career, of course. And I had a decently successful career. I mean, I could pay my bills, but I really wasn't going anywhere. (laughs) You know what I mean? And that was at the time upsetting, but it led me to writing. 
And I enjoy writing so much more than I ever enjoyed acting, to be honest. And I didn't even like, I, I, I think because I had started acting from such a young age and I was like, okay, this is what I want to do. I just never even explored the thought of, of like the other things that I could do because I was like, well, yeah, of course, like I, I enjoy doing X, Y, Z, but like acting is what I do. This is what I'm doing. And without like being knocked off course by life, I might not have really put my mind towards writing and discovered what I feel is really my calling. You know, sometimes it takes a lot longer to find what we really identify with. And it takes the world disassembling us a little bit so that we look at things in a different way. I agree with that completely. And I have teenagers, one who's in college, one who'll be heading to college next year. And, you know, there's so much pressure on them. What do you want to do? What are you going to study? And what do you want to be? And I always say to them, like, you know, I've gone through a variety of different things. And now I'm, I love what I'm doing. But I mean, it took a long time to get here. So pick something that sounds interesting, head that way. And, you know, who knows where you'll end up, but you don't have to decide that you want to be a surgeon or a lawyer or whatever else it is right this very second and then never veer off that course. Right. It's, it's totally acceptable to change your mind. I, I have an older friend who told me many years ago when I was in a chapter change in my life that it's all about chapters. And if you look at it that way, you know, it's not even necessarily endings and beginnings because they're all part of your life. It's the, you know, it's the close of a chapter and the beginning of a new chapter and it's completely okay to embrace that. I mean, we wouldn't want to read a book that doesn't have any chapters. (laughs) (laughs) That's true. That would be quite difficult. (laughs) You could never stop. My husband's one of those that will not stop till he's at the end of a chapter. I just stop wherever and go. But, you know, he'd be like, I cannot stop this book. It has no chapters. (laughs) (laughs) Well, and someone said to me once that instead of looking like your life as one straight road, instead, you're sort of pulling from all these different things. And eventually, everything you've been trying here, doing there, kind of comes together in like almost a circle together versus just thinking I'm on this one path that I can't veer off of. And I love that. I think about that all the time. It keeps life interesting. It does. So I love to talk about titles and covers. Could we talk a little bit about how your title came about and then how your cover came about? A hundred percent. So the title, The Siren, obviously, you know, it's, it's a double entendre. You have a film siren, you know, um, and, and obviously the book is set in the world of film. So it works on that level. But also, you know, the sirens were the ones who would lure with their beautiful voice would hang out on the rocks and lure the men out to sea and can be very seductive. And so there is a character in the book who is that way and appears to be that way. And, you know, over the course of the book, she, she shifts and your perception of her shifts. But I felt like the, you know, using that term, the siren, it it works both ways. And, and also like, if you, if you look at it a little bit more metaphorically, the siren can also be a metaphor for the film industry it, it, and, and for fame. It's, it's, call, it's calling, it's constantly calling to you, right? It, uh, with this beautiful voice and look over here, it can be so wonderful, but the water is deep and, uh, and there, and there are sharks. <laughs> I was just going to say, and there are sharks everywhere. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, in the movie, in the book is entitled the siren too, right? Yes. Yes, it is. So you really have many meanings for the siren being the title. Right. I had initially considered calling it the muse, but I felt that the siren was so much more, more right. Um, I always, you know, when I'm, when I'm titling something, I, you know, I'll have like a working title and my my working title for this was actually body double, which sounds like an eighties, like, (laughs) but it makes sense because Felicity works as Stella's body double. But I always knew that was never going to be the actual title of the, of the book. Yeah. Working titles are always funny and sometimes they stick and sometimes they don't. With my first book, The Lion's Den, it was always The Lion's Den and the publisher wanted to change it initially. And we went through 400, I'm not kidding, different titles and finally came back to The Lion's Den. But with The Siren, it was The Siren from the time that I turned it in, I titled it The Siren and it stuck and everybody has felt like it's the right title for it. Well, like you said, it works on so many levels. Exactly. 
Well, and your cover is interesting to me because it's very distinctive from the lion's den, but it's clear that they go together. Like it's a branding thing for you, I think. And so, you know, it's interesting because they look similar enough that, you know, they go together, but they're very different. Right. And and in the books are, I mean, you know, I'm the same writer, but uh, but they're very different books with different themes. Um, and I think it's important, like with the bright colors and everything on my covers, to let the reader know to lighten up a little bit when you're reading this, that this is escapist fiction. This is not going to be, there is darkness in this book for sure. And there are some very dark scenes. There are some scenes that people could find disturbing. So I will definitely say that it's not all just a romp in the park, but you know, it's definitely meant to be seen as, as more of a page turner, as entertainment. I am not trying to, you know, it, it's not like hyper-realism. It's not like, it's not going to be depressing. <laughs> Is I guess what I'm trying to say. You know, it's this is not a heavy tome. It is uh, entertainment with with deeper themes that run through the book. I really try and and, and meld you know both commercial uh, and literary fiction together in my book. And and I think that the siren is an example of that. As it's something that I hope that people can pick up and fly through. And also take a little bit more away from it than they would, you know, just your average meat read. That's the best combination, a book that draws you in, and it is a page turner, it's super entertaining, but when the author does touch on some more serious subjects, I mean, that's, those are the kind of books I like to read best. Well, that's, that's good to hear because that's what I'm trying to write. <laughs> on that note, are you working on anything at the present? I am. Um, my third book, it's about a cult in the jungle. <laughs> Let's just summarize it by saying that. It's about a girl whose uncle leaves her, dies unexpectedly and leaves her his estate unexpectedly also, um, which includes his retreat center in the Mexican jungle. And she goes down there for his funeral to find that his wife, they weren't actually married, but they're like spiritually married, is basically leading a cult down there in the jungle. And they have some pretty interesting beliefs that she gets deeper into as she gets stuck there. And so it really, in the same way that The Lion's Den dealt with money and The Siren deals with fame, my next book, which is tentatively titled Queen of the Jungle, we'll see whether that sticks, it deals with spirituality and belonging. So that will be my next book. And I'm actually now working on my fourth book, <laughs> which is set at a big pharmaceutical company. It's making an anti-aging drug. Well, that's the funniest thing to me about the publishing industry, the way the timing works. Like by the time you're here promoting the siren and talking about it and it's heading into the world, you're knee deep in your third book, which is probably in edits or whatever. And then you're already thinking about the fourth book. It's kind of, it's got to be hard to compartmentalize that. It's true. Uh, you know, I'm, my intention is to do one a year. And so uh, you re like, I really do always have you basically, it, I will from here on out have basically four different books that I'm constantly juggling because, you know, there's, there's things that need to be done to support the lion's den still, you know, although that one is, is a little bit, you know, has its own legs now. And now, of course, I'm, you know, about to release the siren and I'm doing everything to support that. But then I'm, I'm also, as you mentioned, in edits on my third book and writing my fourth book. And I always have to have my like next books planned out, even though I'm in the middle of moving right now, I'm still uh, and I normally would write like 7,500 words a week or so is basically my goal. And, you know, sometimes you get a little less, sometimes you get a little more. But, you know, if I hit 7,500 a week for my first draft, I can get it done in like you know, four months or so. And that allows me, because I, I think of a first draft as really just like some brilliant person said this and I can't remember who it is. So I'm, it, this did not come from me, but it's like scooping sand into a sandbox, knowing that later on I will make castles. So with a first draft, I don't worry too much about it being perfect. I just get the words onto the page. And then in edits is really when I go back and really flesh it out and make sure that the characters um, have the arcs that I want them to have and that, you know, that you really feel the setting and like all of those details really go into later drafts. But yeah, so I'm, I'm, I am constantly juggling. And even right now in the middle of moving, I'm, I have given myself a break and I'm only doing 5,000 words a week uh, instead of 7,500. But it's still like, you know, for me the writing time and the actual writing time, not just the business of writing time, uh, where I'm dealing with, you know, promotion or whatever, the actual like sitting in front of the computer with my fingers on the keys, 
that is my Zen time. And my husband will be the first to tell you that without that time, I am not as nice a person. (laughs) You know, I'm, it's meditation for me. And it's, it's where I get to be free and creative and I get to spend time with my characters. So it's hugely important to me to protect my writing time, no matter what else is going on. And that's how I'm able to continue pushing the books out because I think of my writing time as sacred. And that's like my number one thing. And I have to always make space for it, whatever else is happening. I think that is absolutely important. Whatever it is that is the sacred thing for a person to block it out, because if you don't block it out, it won't happen. The last year has particularly demonstrated that, that you've got to take whatever it is and say, this is my highest priority. I will plan everything else around it. But then you also need to make sure you do that because if I hadn't had something that I could say, okay, this is what I'm devoted to in the last year, I think it would have made the year a lot worse than it already was. Oh, 100%. Writing my third book during the pandemic, I was escaping every day to the Mexican jungle with these with this creepy cult. <laughs> Which is a lot more fun than the pandemic. <laughs> I was getting my drama on the page instead of in the house. And, and that's, I think, the way to go. Well, yes. And also a break from the news. I mean, you know, for me to have something where I could just put my phone away, put the computer away and instead focus on something else, I just feel like almost saved me. Oh, absolutely. It's funny. My, uh, you know, you get those updates if you have an iPhone at the end of the week, that's like your screen time is five hours a day. And you're like, what? How is that possible? I don't even understand. And it's like, you feel like it's just punishing you like every week. I like keeping that on though, because it does give me a sense for where I am with that. So then I'm like, okay, it was way too high this week. I need to put it away more. (laughs) I've gotten, so I just don't even believe it. I'll think, well, it's because I was using the navigation, you know, it was plugged into my, it was plugged into my navigation or I was listening to a podcast, you know, um, because it does record that if you have the screen on while you're doing it. So. Or reading a book. I mean, you know, if I'm moving around different places, I generally read from NetGalley on my Kindle app on my iPad, but sometimes if I'm out and about or something's happening, I pull it up on my phone and that counts too. I do the same thing. Well, one of my favorite things to hear from authors is what they've read recently and really liked. So what would you recommend? I read a lot all the time. Uh, So I always have books circling in my mind. There's a couple that I would recommend right now. My friend Abby Jimenez's third book just came out, Life's Too Short. And I was lucky enough to blurb that book. And Abby really, she writes romance. But it's more than that. Her books always deal with, you know, real life problems that people are going through. And the heroine of Life's Too Short thinks she may have ALS and she's getting the first symptoms of that and is also struggling with falling in love and feeling like, you know, she may not be able to to live the life that she has wanted to live. So you have romance and you have a real life problem. And the way that Abby handles it is just... It's so good and it's delightful to read. So I highly recommend Life's Too Short, whether or not you're a romance fan. I also just read Finley Donovan is Killing It, which was really fun. It was a page turner about a normal mom um, with normal mom struggles that we all have um, who gets herself in a a bad situation that just because the stuff nightmares are made of that just becomes worse. And this book definitely, it has humor running throughout it in combination with it being a thriller. So I thought that was really enjoyable as well. Let's see. Uh, Mary Dixie Carter's The Photographer is coming out really soon. That was a very different book. Um, Just the way that it's written, it's written from the point of view of this photographer. This is a thriller, kind of like a, I wouldn't say it's a locked room thriller, but sort of because it mostly takes place in this house where this photographer kind of becomes very close to this couple and her point of view is written from the, from the photographer's point of view, the way she talks, the way, like all of it is so cohesive and so disturbing from the very first page. I really think that that's a great read. Let's see, uh, leave the world behind. I just read, I, I loved the writing of that book. That was a very different structurally it was very different than and it did leave me at the end it definitely leaves you hanging a little bit but i would say it's it's still worth reading just because the writing like some writers you know like a cormac mccarthy have this ability to 
really make you feel like you're there. It, it make you recall things from your own life. You know, just like the way that it feels to sit on a couch in the summertime when your skin is a little bit sweaty from the sun and, you know, you feel the fibers of the couch, you know, pressing into your thigh and you're a little bit tired and the air conditioning is cold on your skin. And like, and he does such a good job with that and leave the world behind. So I, I would definitely recommend that one as well. It's been interesting to see the debates on that on Instagram, because I think people, some people really like their ending finite and they want to know what happened and have the story wrapped up and others are happy to just be able to imagine themselves what might have happened. So it's been interesting to see people talk about that one in particular. And I generally will tell you, I fall in the camp of wanting my endings to be endings. And I think that a part of that also comes from being a writer and always having to think of the endings. You know, my books do have endings or endings, you know, there may be a door open where there could be a sequel or where you could think, oh, well, this might not turn out how we think it's going to turn out, but I do wrap things up. And that's one of the most difficult things, you know, as a, writing a thriller is is tying up that ending and making it all make sense and making all of the twists add up in the end. And so you feel like when you read a book that doesn't do that as a writer, I'm like, oh, come on. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> You're like, finish it up. <laughs> finish it. Finish it. But I, that said, I really enjoyed the book. So, And I think it's good to read outside of your comfort zone and read things that don't necess- aren't necessarily something that you would think that you would like. You know, that, that doesn't mean that you should, if you don't like it from page one, keep reading. But, you know, there are certain themes that you're uncomfortable with. Read those themes. If there are certain genres that you're uncomfortable with, it's sometimes good to read a book from that genre just to keep your mind mind open. I agree. I think that's one of the number one things I've learned from this podcast is that I should be more open to things that I don't necessarily pick up on my own, like the genre or the theme, whatever it is. I have read so many books that I either wouldn't have known about at all, or I might not have said on my own, oh, that sounds good. I'm going to pick it up. But when it gets pitched and you know, I'm talking further with the publicist about it, I'm like, oh, maybe I really would like that. So it's been nice. Right. And sometimes I feel like books are marketed in a certain way. You know, they may be marketed as like, this is a romance. And it's really like with Abby's book, it's so much more than that, you know, or, you know, or this is fantasy. Well, when in fact, it's really um, a metaphor for society, you know, whatever it is, like you can often things have more to them than you think that they're going to just based on the cover. That's a major pet peeve of mine, actually. I can't stand it that I feel like that things have to be so compartmentalized in the publishing world. And the other thing I hate is like, it's the next Gone Girl. It's the next, (laughs) you know, whatever it is. And half the time, they're nothing like Gone Girl or whatever it is that the analogies to. And I know they're just trying to give people an idea of it's in this genre or it's, you know, kind of this way. But so many of the times, I think it kind of does a disservice to both books. It's funny because my my, my books are kind of genre bending. They're not you know, they're not, they wouldn't go in the thriller category. They wouldn't go in the romance category. They wouldn't necessarily go in the, you know, literature category. They wouldn't necessarily go in the commercial category. It's like a a meld of all of these things. And I'm just kind of saying, okay, come along with me on the ride. Good luck trying to categorize. (laughs) And I find those are the books that I like the best most of the time. And maybe that's why it bugs me so much that I feel like things have to be more compartmentalized because I generally enjoy the books that pull from several genres. See, that's why I enjoyed The Siren so much. I'm so glad that you enjoyed The Siren so much. I have thoroughly enjoyed speaking with you, Catherine, and I am so glad you came on the Thoughts from a Page podcast today. I did as well. Thank you so much for having me on. Thank you so much for listening to my podcast. If you liked this episode, and I hope you did, please follow me on Instagram at Thoughts from a Page, enter my podcast in the Quill Podcasts Award, and rate or subscribe to it wherever you listen to your podcasts. I would really appreciate it. Catherine's book can be purchased at the Conversations from a Page bookshop storefront, and the link is in the show notes. I hope you'll tune in next time. I'm Allison Holland, host of the Kennedy Dynasty podcast. Equipped with a microphone and a long-term fascination of the Kennedy family, I am joined by an incredible cast of experts, friends, and guests to take you on a fun, relaxed, yet informative journey through history and pop culture. From book references to fashion to philanthropy to our modern expectations of the presidency itself, you'll see that there is so much more to Kennedy than just JFK or conspiracy theories. Join me for the Kennedy Dynasty podcast.